Good morning, good morning. It is December 16th, 2018. It is 8.35 in the morning, and we got a late start this morning because the dog would not be quiet. And if your dog is whimpering continually, take notice. There's something wrong. In this case, it was nothing major, and so we move on. How to make peace in a world full of hate is our first story from Fox News. And this is the second in our holiday series. We gave you a preview of what Black Friday used to look like for us um, when my kids were growing up and we would go Christmas shopping. And that was the first um, time they were allowed to mention the season at all is the day after Thanksgiving. And then yesterday we brought you the legend of St. Nicholas. And today we are talking about the origins of the Christmas tree. And I thought that since we're not doing regular news this morning, this piece by Jensen Franklin was a nice way to start it off because frankly, I couldn't bring myself to do any news this morning. So from Fox News, an opinion piece by Jensen Franklin. We're told the story of Christ's birth, that he was sent to bring peace on earth, Luke 2.14, all throughout the New Testament. The Old and New Testaments, God echoes his promise of peace, and he invites us to be a part of the process as well. Quote, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Close quote, Jesus told his disciples in the famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.9. I don't know how much of the nightly news you've been watching, but it looks to me like we could use a little peacemaking. Yes, Franklin Jensen. Jensen Franklin, I agree. I don't, uh, I'm not just talking about in Israel, Yemen, or Venezuela. I'm talking about amongst our very own family members, friends, and neighbors. Take a quick scroll through social media and you'll find family members in war in a war of words over a political disagreement. Friendships are often ruined with one harsh word. Neighbors never speak again after one trivial dispute. Perhaps you can recall a moment when you contributed to yourself, when you contributed to anger and division yourself. It is clear to me that we desperately need Christ to work in our lives to teach us how to respond in an age of perpetual conflict. It's so easy in our technologically advanced era to hide behind a screen and foster division with harsh rhetoric, thinking there will be no, long, no larger consequences. But there most certainly will be, Proverbs 18.21 cautions us with this, quote, words kill words give life they're either poison or fruit you choose close quote as a follower of christ i know i am commanded no matter how just the cause i am fighting for to always refrain from stirring up division in hebrews 12 14 we're told quote strive for peace with everyone close quote the apostle Paul also implores us, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, Romans 12, 18. In Isaiah 1, 18, the Lord tells us, quote, come now and let us reason together, close quote. Conflict can't continue if you don't participate. This essentially all boils down to one simple rule, be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. I realize there's a lot of shallow and hollow calls for peace out there. Many are well-intentioned but lacking in substance. The version of peace I'm calling for is rooted in Christ and is unattainable without him. 
The honest truth is that you and I are incapable of being effective peacemakers without the the redeeming love of Christ stirring in our hearts. We may broker peace among friends who are bickering or step in to stop a squabble among family members, but what about when an offense is dealt directly toward you? An angry remark, a nasty tweet, a passive-aggressive comment from a loved one. Sooner or later, we give in to our flesh and we hold a grudge or we respond in anger ourselves, driving the wedge deeper and deeper until one day the relationship is totally destroyed. Just as we are unable to be sinless and perfect in our own strength, we are unable to make peace with someone using our own strength. Christ tells us in John 16, 33, In me you you may have peace. Further, along with the same verse, he reminds us, In a world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The only way we can find lasting peace is by submitting our lives to the Prince of Peace. We need Christ to stand in the gap for us. When we're spent and exhausted, it seems like all hope for peace is lost. Christ calls us to put our trust in Him. This Christmas, humble yourselves before the Lord. Ask Him to fill you with His Spirit and give you the peace of God which passes all understanding. Philippians 4-7, not simply a temporary transaction of peace like a ceasefire agreement between nations or a court settlement amongst bitter enemies, but the real and lasting peace. This kind that is anchored deep within our hearts and mind. Thank you, Jensen Franklin. And now we will move on to... The Legends of the First Christmas Tree, a telling by Elder Barry, or Barry, but not Barry like the fruit, it's B-A-R-R-Y, for those of you listening and not watching. Many folk legends have grown around the Christmas tree, Christ's blessing and gift to mankind in the form of a decorated tree remains the central theme of most. Across Europe, people used tree-based folk tales to teach children about the celebration of Christ's birth. The stories about the first Christmas trees. One story tells that when Christianity first came to Northern Europe, three virtues, faith, hope, and charity, were sent from heaven to find a tree that would, that was as high as hope, as great as love, and as sweet as charity. and one that had the sign of the cross on every branch. Their search ended in the forest of the north where they found the fir. Lighted from the radiance of stars, it was the first Christmas tree. Another typical tale tells about a woodcutter who helped who helped small hungry child. The next morning, the child appeared to the woodcutter and his wife and is none other than the Christ child. The child breaks a branch from the fir tree and tells the couple that it will be a tree that at Christmas time will bear fruit. As foretold, the tree is laden with apples of gold and nuts of silver. Various conifers such as spruce, balsam, eastern hemlock, and the scotch pine are used as Christmas trees, but the Scotch pine has surpassed the Douglas fir as the nation's most popular Christmas tree. But in the Holy Land, conifers are mostly small and insignificant and forest few apart from Lebanon with its magnificent cedars, Psalm 104, 16. Even in ancient times, forested areas were small. How did the evergreen come to become associated with Christmas? 
Is it an appropriate symbol in the Christian homes? Is it rooted in paganism or Christian symbolism? Is there a significance to its decorations? Sacred trees in Europe, evergreens, were a symbol of rebirth from ancient times. Egyptians brought green palm branches into their homes in winter solstice as a symbol of life's triumph over death. The Romans decorated with evergreens during Saturnalia, a winter festival in honor of their god of agriculture. In Northern Europe, the pagans observed the solstice festival of Jule, a two-month feast beginning in November with prickly pine branches hung around the doorways and windows to keep away demonic spirits. But the sacred trees of the Druids and Norsemen were deciduous oaks, not evergreen conifers. The Upside-Down Fir Tree during the 7th century, a monk from Devonshire spent time there preaching the word of God. Like any good instructor, he used props. The story goes that he used the triangular shape of the fir tree to describe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that make up the Holy Trinity. But in the 12th century, a fir tree was being hung upside down from the ceilings in Central Europe as a symbol of Christianity at Christmas time. Boniface and Thor's Oak. Legend has it that the missionary to the Germans, St. Boniface, in order to stop sacrifices at their sacred oak, at their sacred, sacred Donar Oak near um, Giesmar, chopped down the tree chopped the tree down in 725 A.D. Supposedly, with one mighty blow, St. Boniface felled the massive oak, and as the tree split, a beautiful young fir tree sprang from its center. St. Boniface told the people that this lovely evergreen, with its branches pointing to heaven, was indeed a holy tree. The tree of life the tree of the Christ child, a symbol of his promise of eternal life. He decorated them, or he instructed them henceforth to carry the evergreen from the wilderness into their homes and to surround it with gifts, symbols of love and kindness. The Paradise Tree. From the 11th century, religious plays called mystery plays, including the popular Paradise Play depicted the story of the creation of Adam and Eve and their sin and banishment from Eden. An evergreen tree was the logical choice for a lush garden tree in this winter festival, and it was decorated with apples symbolizing the forbidden fruit. It ended with the promise of the coming Savior and his incarnation, so gradually, flat wafers symbolizing the forgiveness of sins in communion were added to the paradise tree, making it now just the tree of knowledge, making, making it now not just the tree of knowledge, but also the tree of life. This resulted in very old European custom of decorating a fir tree in the home with apples and small white wafers representing the Holy Eucharist at Christmas time. These wafers were later replaced by little pieces of pastry cut in the shapes of stars, angels, hearts, flowers, and bells. In some areas, the custom was still to hang the tree upside down. In addition to the paradise tree, many German Christians set up a Christmas pyramid called a Lichstock, an open wooden frame with shelves for figurines of the, of the nativity covered with evergreen branches and decorated with candy, pastry candles, and a star. The star, of course, was the Star of Bethlehem. The candles represented the light of Christ coming into the world, the evergreens were the symbol of eternal life, and the candy, fruits, and pastries, the goodness of our life in Christ. 
the fruit of the Spirit, etc. But the 17th, by the 17th century in Lichtstock, and the paradise became tree became merged with the modern Christmas tree. So by the 1600s, which is the 17th century, we have the merging of all of these um, traditions, the pagan traditions um, superseded by various interpretations in Christianity in local areas, merging into what we now know as the Christmas tree. Um, Luther's Christmas tree, the story of Luther's creation of a Christmas tree lit with candles is pure legend with nothing in the inst with nothing in the institute luther scholarship to show support for the tale it is said that he was walking on a bright snow covered starlit night pondering the birth of christ enthralled by the evergreen trees the stars and the landscape he took a tree inside and put a candles on it to represent the majesty he felt about Christ's birth as Jesus came to town, or as Jesus came down from stars to bring us eternal life. The first known decorated Christmas tree, however, was at Riga in Latvia in 1510. Tenenbaum songs date back to the late 1500s. Christmas wreaths. An Advent wreath is a Lutheran custom that originated in Eastern Germany and also migrated to England. They are round as a symbol of God's eternity and mercy and of evergreens as symbols of God's everlastingness and our immortality. Green is also the church's color of hope and new life. Four candles, three purple or violet, that represent penance, sorrow, and longing expectation, and one rose or pink that represents the hope and coming joy are placed within to represent the four weeks of Advent. Wreaths are an ancient symbol of victory and symbolize the fulfillment of time in the coming of Christ and the glory of his birth and in both the German tradition and the English Anglican Church tradition, which is the High Church of England. Um, the three purple candles are lit every Sunday leading up to Christmas, and then all four are lit on Christmas Day. The Christmas Market Trees. By the early 1600s, many German towns were celebrating Christmas with elaborately decorated trees. Christmas markets were set up to provide everything from gifts, food, and more practical things such as a knife grinder or sharpening to sharpen the knife to carve the Christmas goose. Gingerbreads and wax ornaments brought as souvenirs bought as souvenirs were taken home to hang on Christmas trees. A visitor to Strasbourg in 1601 records a tree decorated with wafers and golden sugar twists, barley sugar, and paper flowers of all colors. The early trees were biblically symbolic of the paradise tree in the Garden of Eden. Decorations first used were paper flowers, fruits, nuts, gold foil, cakes, small gifts, and candies. So popular had this custom become that by the end of the 16th century, many communities in Alsace limited or prohibited the use of evergreens for holidays in part to protect the forest from the overcutting of young trees. Christmas trees continued to grow in popularity during the 17th and 18th centuries, particularly among the Lutherans as they had brought the custom to England and the Americas. Modern Christmas trees. 
Christmas trees became fashionable in the mid-1800s. In 1846, the popular royals, Vic Queen Victoria and her German Prince Albert, were il illustrated in the London News with their children around a Christmas tree in America. The White House led the way to trees for holidays, beginning with President Franklin Pierce, despite some congregations' concerns about bringing trees into their religious traditions, trees quickly ad were adopted as symbols of Christ's advent. Special Trees in the Bible Trees are not especially significant as symbols in the Bible, though used as metaphors in Psalm 1-3, Proverbs 11-30, Psalm 104.16 and Dan, Daniel 4. Several trees, however, are key symbols. The tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden symbolizes the temptation and fall of man, Genesis 3. It was a fruit tree, obviously. Mankind sinned by eating its fruit through, though commanded not to by God. I would just parenthetically note that mankind sinned by giving way to the temptation to do something that was forbidden, not by eating a fruit. Uh, the tree of life appears at both the beginning and the end of the Bible. Genesis 2, 9, 3, 22, and Revelation 22, 2. The branch is one of the titles given to the Messiah in Isaiah 4, 2, 11, 1, Jeremiah 23, 5, Zechariah 3, 8, and 6, 12. The cross is spoken of as a tree in Galatians 3, 13 and 1 Peter 2, 24. It is the most significant tree in the Bible a symbol representing the Savior's giving the Savior's giving himself to the, as the sacred as the sacrifice for sins of men. Christmas trees are neither significant pagan nor biblical symbols, but various Christian traditions have evolved that use the evergreens and its decorations to symbolize and teach the wonderful truths of the advent God sending his son to bring eternal life to a fallen world through though abused by popular culture Christmas trees may still point to that true light of the world um, and then there's a whole bunch of um, references at the end of this article and the link to this article will be in the show notes. Uh, so let's look at another uh, explanation of the Christmas tree's evolution from when it was started until now. People celebrating Christmas should perhaps see behind the outward glamour of the trees with its candles, balls, silver tinsel, and shiny star at the top. But looking at it again with an open heart and listening to what it can tell us. In ancient philosophies and religions, for example, it found that the tree has often been used as a symbol for the universe whose roots sprang forth from the divine heart of all things and whose trunk, branches, twigs, and leaves were the different worlds and spheres. Uh, in the origin of the Christmas tree, the custom of a Christmas tree undecorated is believed to have be begun in Germany in the first half of the 700s, and we just read those legends. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in the 18th century, in England, Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria, made Christmas trees fashionable by decorating the first English Christmas tree at Windsor Castle with candies and a variety of sweets, fruits, gingerbread in 1841. Other English families followed suit using all kinds of items as decorations. Charles Dickens described such a tree as being covered with dolls 
miniature furniture, tiny musical instruments, costume jewelry, toy guns and swords, fruit and candy in the 15, 1850s. In America, most 19th century Americans found Christmas trees an oddity. The first record of one being on display was in the 1830s by the German settlers of Pennsylvania. They put one on show to raise money for a local church. In 1851, a tree was set up outside of a church. The people of the parish thought it such an outrage and a return to paganism that and asked the minister to take it down. But in the 1890s, Christmas ornaments were arriving from Germany and Christmas tree popularity was on the rise again around the U.S. In the 20th century, uh, the earliest 20th, 20th century saw Americans decorating their trees mainly with homemade ornaments, while the German-American sect continued to use apples, nuts, and marzipan cookies. Popcorn joined in after being dyed bright colors and interlaced with berries and nuts. Electricity brought about Christmas lights making it possible for Christmas trees to glow for days on end. I just might suggest that with all those uh, ornament laden branches, the um, idea that the Christmas tree is a massive fire hazard, um, you know, exists today, whether it's electricity or candles. Nevertheless, the modern concept in the 21st century, the late 1990s and 21st century tree has taken the innovative idea with new themes and conceptual designs. Some of the theme included the starry night tree, the twilight tree, the snow queen tree, the toy tree, the country tree, the gingerbread tree, the feather tree, the angel tree, the Santa tree, and the white tree. Oh, and the doll tree, and the blue tree, and the nutcracker tree, and the teddy bear tree, and the fiber optic tree, and many others. I just want to correct this author. This didn't start in the late 1990s. This started in the early 1960s, at least in my memory, because they were making white trees and silver tinsel trees, and you could set up this rotating light that would cast um, red, green, and blue, and sometimes yellow uh, light onto the tree to make it change colors. Just saying. Um, and then, again from Mark Fox News, turning the corner a little bit, Chef Lydia Bastiana, Bastianich says, let's cherish our seniors this holiday. The kitchen's perfect place to do that. And uh, this is by an opinion piece by Lydia Bastianich of Fox News. And I happen to have a particular affection for Lydia's mother, Nona. And um, Nona means grandmother. Nona or Noni means grandmother in Italian. Um, Ermina or Ermina, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, Lydia's mother is really a jewel at 98, and I have enjoyed her being on the show. Uh, when I used to watch TV, I would watch Lydia's cooking show just to see Nona. Lights, gifts, and lots of food. The holidays are here and many people are busy preparing unforgettable experiences for their children and grandchildren. I am no exception, but another important person on my holiday list is my mother, Ermina, who turns 98 years old next month. When we all gather at our home, there are four generations present, and having everyone together is truly a heartwarming experience. In today's busy world, grandparents can sometimes feel left behind. This is a perfect time of year to remember that our older generations 
have strong roots and long and deep life experience and offer the unconditional love that children need to help strengthen their identities and become responsible and respectful adults. It is so important that seniors feel loved and rewarded for their work and dedication in rise, raising the family and the kitchen is a perfect place for them to feel connected to everyone. Nona Ermina gives, lives with me and has always been involved in preparing holiday meals. Sometimes we bake and cook with the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. Other times, the two of us cook and bake together. Knowing that the younger generation will reap the delicious rewards of our work in the family kitchen, my mother particularly likes to help roll out the apple strudel dough and help place cookies on the baking sheets to go in the oven. We also have a tradition of decorating our tree with seasonal fruits and candies. Nona and Romina loves to tie with the ribbons they hang from on the tree. We work together to decide the holiday menus, where the tree should go, and which gifts should be exchanged, and much more. We like to drive to church and community events and look at the Christmas lights that decorate the neighborhoods along the way. My mother loves to sing and listen to music, so we enjoy Christmas carols and some of our own traditional songs from when I was a girl in Istria, in Italy. Following an evening out to celebrate the holidays, we come home and play cards over a warm glass of hot compote, a traditional wintertime drink from, drink from our homeland made of fruits and spices. Seems to me I know somebody else who's doing something like that this Christmas. In our, ho in our house, we celebrate Christmas by having a big Italian family-style meal. Nona Irmina is always the first to put on her apron and get involved in all of the planning. She begins even before the big day by cleaning garlic, onions, celery, carrots, and other vegetables that will be used in, as side dishes. She dresses our appetizers with olive oil and salt and helps assemble the table centerpieces, which are typically made with seasonal fruit. If you have never seen an Italian Della Robbia wreath or um, swag, it is a beautiful uh, tradition of evergreen um, with candied sugared fruits as decorations. It is always just stunning. Following the meal, Nona Ermina still has the energy and energy left and is ready to challenge the teenage great-grandchildren to card games, checkers, and chess. And yes, she often wins, as did my mother on the rare occasion when we played guard, card games. Nona Ermina is a great storyteller and her great-grandchildren love to listen to her talk about her child in, childhood in Istria, Italy, especially about living on the farm and tending the animals. Her stories can be dramatic. She often reminds them of her daring escape from her homeland shortly after World War II. However, however she always lightens them up by telling some funny mistakes she made in England during her first year as an immigrant in New York. Funny mistakes she made in English, sorry, during her first year as an immigrant in New York. One of our favorites is when she mistakenly purchased dog biscuits and served them as cookies to her guests. Most grandparents have wonderful family stories to tell, and this is a perfect time of year to encourage them to talk about those cherished memories and oh, what you can learn from those memories. Like many seniors, there is nothing Nona or Mina enjoys more than spending time with her family. The holidays are a time to connect, say thank you, eat delicious foods, and sing. Holiday experiences are just as important as gifts, and all of us should make an effort to effort this holiday season to connect with our beloved older generation. 
I could not agree more with Lydia Bastianich. And her, the, the writing of this opinion piece reminds me uh, very much of um, my, my relationship with my mother in the last decade or so of her life. So for The Shepherd and I, we hope you have enjoyed taking a look at where Christmas trees came from and how they have evolved. We hope you are well and blessed. And until we see you again, have a great Sunday.